so please feel free to take a flyer on your way home. Um, and SMA has here resources uh, from the National Museum of the Caribbean Elderly that she might want to mention, so I just wanted to let everyone know where they were. Would you like me to put them in there? Sure, or you can search them either way. Or yeah. okay. Okay. Hi. So I'm going to circulate we are very pleased to have with us today Dr. S. K. Kohler Thompson. There's no P. Oh, this is right. S. is from the Faculty of Social Work and has had a nice long history with the Institute. So we're very, very pleased that she can be here today to talk about her um, research on grandparents. Uh, Lucy, are we all ready to go? Yes. Excellent. So welcome, Esme, and I'll let you take it away. Well, it's such a delight to be here. I've attended many, many uh, seminars over the last 15 years on that side of the desk, so I thought it was only fair that I stand on this side of the desk. By the way, last week, uh, Andy Ackenbaum gave an unbelievably powerful uh, presentation, so if you haven't had a chance to see it, it's hopefully online. It is. All right. So I'm talking about grandparent caregiving. So by this, I don't mean that grandma's helping out while the you know mom's working and um, it's sort of the nine to five. I'm talking about what we call custodial grandparents. So these are grandparents who are doing the whole job. Uh, due to a variety of reasons, it might be due to the fact the child was born when the mother was quite young and mom stepped in from day one. Could be due to mental health problems, to the death of a parent, um, to addictions, all kinds of different reasons. And, and surprisingly, we don't know exactly what proportion of these different reasons um, uh, cause what proportion. But we're, we're, those are just sort of the groupings of reasons why grandparents raise grandchildren. So I, uh, I have to acknowledge first Meredith Minkler, who's been my colleague for the last 15 years on doing a lot of this grandparenting research. And she's been here to speak and on different topics over the last decade or two. Um, and also, um, where it isn't my research, I give you citations for others. It's, it, there's a whole field that really started in the beginning of the 1990s. I've been on the, in it since about 1994-95. And it's a real, really a burgeoning area, particularly in the U.S. There hasn't been very much attention to it yet in Canada. Um, it's nice to see old students here, actually. Um, okay. So, as I said, it's going to be interactive. How many children are being raised in skipped generation households? So by skipped generation, the older generation, the grandparents are there, the grandkids are there, and there's nobody in the middle of the generation. So not the parents of the grandchild, but also not the aunts and uncles. The reason we have to do it this way is that there's no questions in the Canadian census specifically about grandparent caregiving. We have three in the American census specifically about it, so we can know a lot more about what's going on in the US. But in Canada, we have to reconstruct households. And so the only way to figure it out is to, to go with the, the brute force, just grandparents and grandkids in the households. Okay, so the first question is how many? Second question is how has it changed? Well, the how many, it's not a huge number. It's about 8,900 children in 2006 in Ontario. And, but that's a 60% increase in 15 years. So typically, demographic trends do not go in a 60% increase in 15 years. This is a, a huge shift in our population. Now, We'd expect Canadian numbers, these are Ontario numbers, but we'd expect Canadian numbers to be about one-tenth of what American numbers are because our population is about one-tenth. Actually, we're one one-hundredth. So it's two order of magnitudes difference. And I think that's part of the reason why the American research is so far ahead compared to ours is it just it's, a, it's proportionately a much smaller problem. I don't really know um, exactly why that's so, but we have lower rates of female incarceration. We have lower rates of teen pregnancy, and we have lower rates of drug addiction, and we have less poverty. And all of those things are, are associated with risk factors. So that probably has something to do with it. Okay, 
So that number, 8,900, that's just from the census. But the CAS, which is our child welfare agency here in Ontario, um, also has kids in kinship care. And they, it's, called, it's called kinship care. So these are children being raised by relatives, usually grandparents, but also aunts and uncles, sometimes older siblings. But uh, the vast majority are grandparents. Um, and they are actually receiving money. It, um, they've met the foster care requirements. And we'll talk a little bit more about how you can get into kinship care. So uh, the question is, what percentage of kids in care do they comprise? Well, oh, that was the end. I didn't really want to go there. Hold on a second. Let me try this one. OK. Um, there's a, only 900. So of those 8,900 kids, it was skipped households. And by the way, again, that's an underestimate, because if I had my teenage son, who was not the parent of the child in the household, they wouldn't have been one of those 8,900. But there's only 900 kids in kinship homes in Ontario. In other words, it's like 10 percent, 10 or less, of, or fewer of the children are actually getting some financial assistance through CAS. But that represents about 5% of the kids in Ontario CAS care. There's about 18,000 kids in care, give or take a bit. So um, I guess I want to emphasize two things. In other words, it's not a big portion of the CAS budget at the moment. And the second thing is, remember we talked about nine, eight, almost 9,000 kids? If we added those to the foster care, you're talking about adding 50% into foster care. Well, we're already having a crisis in foster care, not enough foster homes, etc. So I, I'm hopefully building a case that um, kinship care, which we'll talk about, is good for kids, but it also gives opportunities for kids to stay out of the foster care system and, and grow healthy lives. We just have to put some more supports in place. Okay, so this, I came with a little bit of a bias. So I'm going to make you commit. Write it down, because I'll tell you the answer. What percentage of grandparent caregivers, in, I'm talking about these skipped generation ones, are male? That's the first one. The second part is, are many grandfathers raising grandchildren without a wife in the home? <laughs> and uh, I have interviewed a man in his late 70s raising two grandkids under five. They, they do exist, but they're rarer, as you'll see. So about 41% of caregivers are grandfathers, but not many of those grandfathers are doing it solo. They're really, they're co-parenting. But if you look at the grandmothers, you've got about 40% of the grandmothers are actually doing it on their own. So in general, it's either couples or women providing this, uh, this care. With some, with some valiant men out there doing it. And they're very isolated, at least the qualitative research, they're very isolated because even if you're an older woman, you have a hard time getting finding peers that are interested in hanging out with you and your kids. But it's even harder if you're an older man, I think. So, so it, it, they're, they're a neglected subpopulation. Okay, age. Pardon? Eighty-four. Eighty-four years old. Okay. Well, there's few that are that old. Not too many. That would be, and typically those would be great grandmoms stepping in. Okay. 60s, 70s, mostly 70s. Okay, let's throw out some more ideas. There are some, there's some, pardon? But late 50s is the average. Um, uh, my colleague Meredith Minkler was, did a qualitative study in Oakland with 79 inner city grandparents. And the youngest was? 27. Oh. Wow. I was trying to figure out 13, 14, 12, 15, you know, it's just the, anyway, but that's extremely rare, as you see. So only about 12% are under 45. You get about 28% are in that 45 to 54, 36 or 55 to 64, and then uh, it goes down from there. There's not too many that are 75 and over, um, and the, the health consequences are, are fairly substantial for the older population in particular. But I want you to note that middle group, 55 to 64. We're going to talk about poverty. And let's leave work at 55 to care for grandkids and try to get back in and undermine your pensions. There's all kinds of issues that, that this, you know, from 45 to 60 are really critical earning times, particularly for people who've left the workforce for their own kids. You know. All right. So how many kinship families are raising more than one grandchild? 
Two or more. The majority? I thought it would be about half, but in fact it's only about 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, 80% are just raising one. So we don't know exactly why that is, but of course the consequences for multiple children are more. And certain ethnic subgroups have, have a higher percentage that are raising bigger families. All right. Now I'm not going to ask you to say it out loud. I'm going to ask you to write down in Canada what's the majority care group, what racial ethnic group represents the majority of caregivers. And once you've written down your Canadian um, uh, guess, guess your American one. All right, and I won't, I won't challenge it. Three quarters of Canadian grandparent caregivers are white. This is not the image in the media, I don't think, but at all. It's very much seen as an African-American inner city uh, uh, issue. But in fact, the, disproportionately, First Nations are vastly overrepresented. Only about 3% of our population are First Nations. 17% of the skip generation households are First Nations. They're, like, they're five times what you'd expect in the population. Now, African-Americans are third with 4%. Now that's twice what you'd expect if there's 2% of the population, you'd think that they'd be 2% of this, that's 4%. But they're still a very small subgroup. Um, uh, but, but in the US, probably a lot of you came up with African American, and again, 50% are white, not Hispanic white in the US. It's just that that's not the media coverage of it. Basically, grandparent caregivers are rural and urban and inner city and suburban and they cover every um, socioeconomic status and every race as you can see but um, it, it's very much the media is really concentrated on, on crack grandmoms in the inner city at least that's what you see mostly okay all right so what what theories should I draw upon to understand why people grandparent care give and uh, to understand their experiences. Culture theory. Okay, and can you elaborate? Who said it? Oh, you said it, Deb. I don't know. Well, I know that in certain cultures, taking care of the parents are are part of it, but I also know that it goes in the reverse direction. So that I know I'm, I'm good friends with Asian families, even here in North America, and their families from the parents, the grandparents from China, come over to look after the kids for the first couple of years. First, it's the mother's side, then it's the father's side. So that's where, I, and I've heard that. So okay, so different norms of filial solidarity exactly. within different cultures. Okay, we'll get to that. And I had a great idea, and it. Uh, analysis blew it out of the water, but I thought that was great. But okay. <laughs> what else? Uh, what else? Any other ideas? Well, gender theory. Okay, for sure. But you know, it's it's women's job to look after the kids. So, if the grandchildren need help, it makes logical sense that. I mean, unlike the woman I met this morning who said. I'm not taking care of my grandchildren. <laughs> I, I, I did that already. But in a lot of cases, females feel a particular solidarity with their children's children. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. We touched on two of them. But I presented some of my early research 15 years ago to a parenting class at OISE. And Carl, whose last name I forget at, um, at the moment, he said, have you thought of evolutionary theory? And I said, oh, you've got to be kidding. And, you know, but being a good academic, I try to be open to this. And, uh, you know, I started looking at it. There really is something there. So qualitatively, I've interviewed grandparents who didn't even know they had grandchildren. They had been estranged from their mentally ill or their um, drug-addicted daughter. And they get a call from a, a CAS in a different city saying, we're taking your grandchildren into care. You've got two of them. They're age three and one. Um, are you interested in taking custody? And they say, yes. That, those children are not going into foster care over my dead body. I'll be there tomorrow. 
and they throw their life into complete disarray. You know, they've been planning to retire, you know, they have to move from their condo to their other, um, to, to, to a bigger house. It doesn't make sense from a, an objective standpoint, uh, standpoint. And I certainly understand if you have a relationship with a grandchild, a lot of uh, kids, you know, grandparents have been involved with the kids all the way through, and then when the middle generation has a mental breakdown, or, you know, they have a relationship. But even when people don't have a relationship, they're there. They step forward. And if they're not physically or able to do it, they're emotionally wrenched about it. There is some hardwiring going on. And so I looked at the research, and it's there's some surprising facts that seem to be supportive of it. Now, I'm a social worker. We don't really talk about evolutionary theory very often. But I, anyway, I, I'm up for, it's up for discussion. But So the idea of evolutionary theory, and sort of the Darwinian idea, is that investing in future generations helps you pass on your genes, basically. And I'm not saying this is objective. If I, when I talk to grandparents, and sometimes I present this, and they're like, you got to be kidding. We do it because we love the kids. And I said, well, you hadn't met the kid. How could you love the kid? And he said, well, you know, it's, that's just what parent, grandparents do. So uh, they do not have a sense that I need my DNA down there. That's, it's not a conscious idea at all. And so I'm not trying to say that. But I'm just saying that there's surprising evidence to suggest that it is uh, beneficial for your offspring for grandparents to be very involved. And actually, those of you who know grandparents, not just grandparent caregivers, have you ever seen what gush balls people turn into when they have grandchildren? Like, very normal people go over the top completely, you know? Even before the baby's born, so they have not a relationship with this baby. It's like they're knitting up a storm and they're changing their work so that they'll be able to be there a lot. And, you know, there's some hardwired stuff going on for sure. Can okay. I, yes. Can I just ask a question sure. on that note? Does. Um, the finding about that kind of commitment then override the economic implications? Is that what you're Well, I, I'm just saying objectively the economic implications are so profound that there would be no logical reason to do it if you were just a sort of exchange okay. theory or something like that. It just doesn't work. So there must be something else to it, and evolutionary theory might have something for it. Michelle? What about attachment theory? Wouldn't that take some part of us? Well, yes, it would. Less so if you weren't if you weren't attached to the grandchild because you hadn't met them. How you were with your mother and your father and your yeah. kids, and so you sort of get a sense this is my this is what this I do yeah. because this is my attachment mm -hmm. to my family. Therefore, it extends to my grandchildren. Right. So Michelle's point is that it's it's sort of intergenerational transmission of attachment and attachment patterns. And certainly you are more, uh, in the First Nations uh, study, we did qualitative interviews, and a lot of the grandparents had in fact been raised by their grandparents as well. So there were, not all, but there was that norm that that was there. So there's some normative piece going on. It's possible, it's possible. Uh, you know, I'm usually using secondary data, so I can't really pull it apart, but I think you probably have something there. Um, okay, so there's this Hamilton's rule that you helping behavior for your offspring um, will only occur if the benefits of helping the recipient outweigh the cost to the donor. And there's significant costs, so you, so you have to think about that. And it's influenced by how direct the relationship is. So you'd be more likely to raise a granddaughter than to raise a great niece, because you're, you're more of your genes are there, that sort of thing. Um, Okay, so Gibson and Mace have done some research on this, and it's actually very interesting what they've written up. So they propose that grandmothers in particular are very helpful to grandchildren, more so than grandfathers, and they suggest that that's why women live longer than men. So now, it's really hard to figure out what a natural lifespan is. I know, you know that women's lifespan in particular has gone up dramatically. Well, we've all gone up, but women in particular over the last hundred years because of a uh, decrease in mortality. Um, but um, how do you think they found out what a natural lifespan was? How did they find a group of males and females that had similar lifespan, life uh, behavior, health behaviors, and lifestyle? Monks and nuns. 
<laughs> which is a very creative way of doing it because theoretically they have very similar food, they have very similar level of stress, they have similar life patterns. And women do live on average around five years more than men, which is what we see in the general population, but it's, a, it's hard to figure that out because of difference in smoking and stress and, and other respons responsibilities. So they suggest that, um, that women live longer because they're more beneficial to the grandchild's survival than men. Okay, and then let's just, and, and also we'll talk to you in a minute, there's been some interesting studies in Finland and, and uh, Canada, uh, Quebec in particular, historically about the evolution of menopause. Because although we're just beginning to see that some of the, some primates may in fact um, go into menopause, we're just having long enough studies in, in uh, domesticated settings to figure it out. Menopause is actually a very strange thing. Why not just keep pumping out babies till you drop? Which is what almost every other mammal species and most species in the world do. So there might be some, um, why would it be, the idea is that as you get older, the risk for childbirth go up, as do the risks for the child, the, the being born. And if you've invested in children, but they're not fully adult, risking um, pregnancy it's better to invest in the children you already have and help out with the grandchildren than to risk dying and getting those ones you've just invested 10 years in, they die because you weren't there to help. So that's the theory anyway. So here's some research that Gibson Mace did in Ethiopia. So children who had one grandmother alive in comparison to those who had none had 37% lower odds of dying before the age of three. That's, those are very high odds, a uh, big difference. But grandfather's presence was not significantly associated with child survival. Um, and maternal grandmom, so the mom's mom being present, was a positive predictor of height and weight, particularly for girl grandchildren. So the baby's fine when, he's, when he or she is breastfeeding. But once they're a toddler and the, baby, the mother goes and has another child, the, the, in hunter-gatherer com communities, the child is dependent on what's hunted and gathered, particularly gathered. Now, the problem is that the mother is constrained because she's breastfeeding. She doesn't have as much energy. She's focused on the new baby. She can't gather as much. So the idea is grandmothers, particularly maternal grandmothers, make up the extra, uh, the loss of extra food and share it with the grandchildren. Um, and they also help the mother with the heavy housework so she has more time and energy to to, vote to the kids. So uh, that's their theory. And now the study in Finland and Quebec, Quebec's great because everybody stayed in the same communities and they registered, there was, everyone was christened in the church and died in the church. And so they could figure out whole family lines. And they found that women who lived longer post-reproductive lifespan had more surviving grandchildren, and, it's, and they believe it's because they invested in, in assisting the grandchildren in both child care, but also in food and, and those types of issues. All right, so that was a little bit of a leap for the average social worker. This is where most of it makes sense, and it builds on what Bev says. The gender intersectionality um, talks about not just a feminist pr perspective, which is where I come from normally, but the idea that you have to think of, of gender race and class interacting. So family caregiving, this is what Beth was saying, family caregiving is primarily a female activity um, and caregiving influences your labor force participation. But race has a huge impact on your life opportunities. Uh, now this literature mostly comes out of the US and looks at the African American community, but you can see the native, uh, the First Nations community very clearly reflected in this too that inequalities in access to labor force, uh, labor market and education are very influenced by race. And if white women, women earn more on average than African American men, then you can't just look at one aspect of, of these. Now class, which is where I do a lot of my research, education, income and wealth, that's a huge influence on your health and your life opportunities, your access to your labor force. In the US context, it's health insurance. Um, but in the Canadian context, it would be good food and nutrition and all of those other, and lower stress if you're not, if you're not as financially strapped, better child care, all of those pieces. And neighborhoods with high crime, poor schools, and few resources, okay? So in fact, most of our research really comes out of that, but I like the evolutionary stuff. <laughs>
Okay. Now this is the this is the second thing Beth was mentioning. So family solidarity theory is maybe just people with higher family norms, which may be culturally induced or maybe just uh, through intergenerational transfer of norms, makes the difference. And in fact, in the early 90s, you saw media coverage. All oh, these grandparents are just empty nesters. They want to just grab the kids and go on. So I had data, the US data, from 88 and 93, well, Mary and I together. And I looked at people in 1988 who were no, not grandparent caregivers. And I looked at all these questions about family solidarity. And uh, then I looked at the ones who became caregivers versus not, with the hypothesis that those who had higher norms would be the ones who became grandparent caregivers. Not a, blew up completely. The only factor, uh, and all these different measures of, of closeness and emotional closeness and physical contact and, and also these norms, the only thing that came through was if in 1988 you answered, I sometimes want to be free of my parenting responsibility, and you said yes, you're more likely to have signed up for your grandchild by 1992 to 94. <laughs> so the more likely, it, the people that were fed up in 88 have just signed up for another 20 year stint, basically by 92 to 94. So that's why my theory, I guess, you know, it's always good to test theories because you're clearly, it made so much sense before I tested it, but it has nothing to do with norms. Basically, reality presents and people step forward, no matter their personal inclination. In the, in the back to that hardwired, you'll do it, no matter how much it puts you out. Personally, I have a theory. I don't. Again, this is secondary data analysis. I think your kid was a hellion that was driving you crazy as a teenager, and he, he or she got pray, uh, had children and left you holding the bag. I think that's probably the context that acting out behavior in, in your, the teen years is what I was seeing in the 1988 response but they, they stepped forward and, and uh, helped out. But it wasn't, it certainly is not that you have higher norms and therefore you're doing it. It's, I think people do it because they have to do it, not because they choose, to, you know, it's, it's, it's not a lifestyle choice that people are doing. Um, okay, the big question, and again, I'm a gerontologist, so I'm gonna draw on some other literature. The big question, of course, is are kinship families good for children? Anecdotally. Who's the cute kid? Yes, Marcel. It's, uh, it's Obama. So he was raised by his maternal grandparents. His, his mom it was co, when she, I guess, divorced, she was with, lived with them for a while. Then they, she, her mom, his mom remarried and moved somewhere, Singapore, somewhere in the Far East. And when, he, when it was high school time, she wanted him to have a high school education. So he moved back to Hawaii and was raised by his grandparents. So here we've got a political leader. Who is he? Do you want a hint? Yes. Famous British scientist. Newton. Newton. Sir Isaac Newton. So Sir Isaac Newton's mom, uh, father died when his mom was pregnant with him. And she remarried the minister down the road when he was, when she was, when uh, Sir Isaac was three. I don't know if he was a Sir Isaac then, but Isaac was three. And uh, his, the stepfather never accepted him. He never lived with his mother ever again. He always lived with his grandma. Hmm. Um, okay, so here we got a leader of science. Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou, two for three, well done. Okay, so she, there isn't an official poet laureate in the United States, but she would be it if there was one. She, she's a wonderful poet, and she um, did the inaugural address in Clinton's first uh, inauguration, I think. The, she did the inaugural poem, and she, actually she's a wonderful, wonderful poet, if you have a chance to meet her. Anyway, she had a quite traumatic childhood, which she writes, she's written four or five books that are sequentially her autobiography. And it's something like when the caged bird sings, is that the, the right name? Uh, is the experience. Anyway, so her mother wasn't fully functional for, at various points in life and left her with her maternal grandparents. So anecdotally, you've got leaders of politics, leaders of science, and uh, leaders of the arts who are grandparent caregivers. But I'm a quantitative researcher, so that's not going to do it for me. But uh, certainly it's a good start. <laughs> um, so um, there's. There's been a wonderful study by um, Solomon and Marx. They uh, done it about 1995, 96, and they looked at one of the American large, large 
uh, population-based studies that were following children and adolescents for 20 years. And they looked, just because the sample was so big, they could look at the kids who were raised by two-parent families, single-parent families, and grandparents and compare them. So this is as good as you can get because they're really representative samples of all three. And the outcomes are pretty darn good. So they had comparable health outcomes of kids raised in um, kids. So right now I'm just comparing the, the uh, grandparent-headed households and the two-parent families. They had lived with asthma, headaches, accidents, or injuries. They were comparable to um, two-parent families. Behavioral outcomes, the percent who were obedient to school. So these were great studies in that they asked the teachers, not just the slightly biased grandparents and parents. So they asked everybody. So the percent who behaved for teachers, the percent who never expelled, they were doing just as well. Now remember, it's not even a fair comparison because these children have had really significant losses in their lives or they wouldn't be being raised by their grandparents. So to, rate, to compare them with two-parent families to, to um, uh, kids raised by grandparents isn't totally the, the fair. And also the income of grandparent-headed households is a lot lower. And um, most of these outcomes are very influenced by income as well. So it isn't even a fair comparison, but they're doing remarkably well. Now the school outcomes, they didn't do quite as well with the school outcomes. They were less likely to be rated as above <coughs> average students by their teachers. They were more likely to have repeated a grade. But they were comparable to kids in single-parent families on these outcomes. Um, now, I think the whole idea about skipping a grade, some of them have been uh, exposed, or, or um, missing a grade, some of them have been exposed to a lot of mobility in their lives before they came into their grandparents' care, so they might have moved from place to place to place. And transitions in school are highly predictive of not doing well in school and also needing to repeat because you're just, you start again and socially it's so disruptive. So I think that might explain part of this. But a fair comparison uh, by Winokur, Holtren, and Valentine, they did a systematic review, which uh, some of you know very well, it is a, a very comprehensive review of all of the literature. And uh, they, they compared grandparents and foster, grandparents, grandchildren who were raised by grandparents to those who are raised in, in traditional foster care, so non-immediate -family, non, uh, family foster care. This is a fair comparison because they've had similar amounts of losses in their lives, right? And the outcomes are great, typically. Children in kinship care were twice as likely to report positive emotional health. They're only half as likely to experience mental illness. Now, the question about mental illness is it that they're not being seen as much so that maybe they're not diagnosing it, or is it really that there's a difference? So foster kids were more likely to receive mental health services than kinship care services, but they, were, they were, had the same amount of physician's care. So it's not like the grandparents weren't taking them to the doctor, they were taking them to the doctor, so probably it means that there's a true difference in the mental health diagnosis, because it's, it, it's not as though that they just weren't flagging it, it probably didn't exist, in other words, the kinship care were doing better. Safety. Now this is interesting. I had not expected this. So kinship care children were less likely to experience, and I quote, a substantiated incidence of abuse or neglect while in an out-of-home placement setting than children in foster care. Normally you would have expected the opposite, that foster care kids would have been less likely to be abused or have the substantiated case than kinship care because those are highly trained professional foster parents. Now I can't quite figure it out. It could be the bottom that kinship families didn't have as much supervision, so there might have been less reporting. Like that the, the social worker wasn't popping in on the kinship family as much so they may not have been seeing it. The other piece is that kinship, uh, that family foster care, like the traditional foster care, you have non-related siblings, in the uh, non-related kids in the home. So you'd have a substantiated abuse could have been one kid beating up on another kid, a non-related kid. So it may have something to do with that. We don't know exactly what it means. Now with respect to behavioral development, the kinship kids had lower levels of internalizing behavior. That's talking about withdrawn, passive behavior. They had lower levels of externalizing behavior, the aggressive, delinquent behaviors, and they had higher levels of confidence and adaptive behavior. Just generally across the board, they were doing better. Now stability, anybody work in child welfare? 
this is a new high focus in uh, child welfare is that we should keep the kids as stable as possible. And you know, I've heard cases of kids under the age of two who've already been moved four times. And if you're thinking about attachment theory, what are you doing to these children, right? So the um, children in foster care were three times as likely as kinship care children to experience three or more placements. In other words, they've been moved from their home to foster home one, foster home two, foster home three. Um, and so why does st placement stability matter? There's pr strong literature showing that you have more placement stability, you have school stability, better educational outcomes, fewer pro behavioral problems, fewer emotional problems, and better well-being, which makes total intuitive sense. Those of you who have children, can you imagine moving them three times and not hearing about it or not having some repercussions you know, in, a sh in a relatively short period of time of movement? Okay, so but now the interesting question is about permanency. So along with stability, they want permanency. So children in kinship care were more likely to remain in care, in other words, be child welfare wards, than children in foster care. But this was not that they were less likely to reunify with their parents. What it was is that they were less likely to be adopted. So the kinship parent, the grandparent, is willing to care for the child, but does not really want to go to court and say to their daughter, you are not capable of ever raising this child and we're going to terminate all of parental rights. So they, they're much more likely to have the status quo, take the custody, but not do the legal, the legal adoption. I think for the child, it probably makes little difference as long as they know grandma's always there for them, whether, as long as they've got the custody and can sign the health forms and those types of things. Um, so they, they're more likely to get legal custody. An average foster parent doesn't get legal custody, but they, but they weren't as much to get the uh, adoption. So this is a statistical trend, not a P less than 0.10, for those of you who remember some of my old classes and stuff. Uh, but uh, the tendency for foster care children to be more likely to repeat a grade, grade than kinship care. So remember, the kinship care, the grandparent-headed household kids didn't do as well as two-parent families. They did about the same as single-parent families. Well, they're doing better than kids in foster care. Um, their attachment scores, or there's a trend towards them being stronger, of what you were saying earlier. Um, the nice thing is that they retain connections to their extended family, their aunts, their uncles, their cousins. And um, they're more likely to report that they always felt loved, which I think should be one of our <laughs> major objectives of child welfare. Okay, so this is a American Association of Retired People um, did some of their artwork. And so I, I don't know if you can see it, but it says, Dear Grandma, everything is all smiles with you around. You make my life all smiles. I dance when you are happy. Thank you for everything you do for me and got me. Love always. And the artist is a 10-year-old Jessica. There's also a really cute one. Thank you for everything you do for me, particularly for my Pocahontas underwear. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so there's additional benefits. Familiar environment, it's less traumatic. You know, popping into grandma's house, this feels much less than traumatic than being pulled out of my home and sent to a stranger's. Now. I know from many of my students who do work in child welfare, Friday night you get a call, you've got three kids, you have almost zero chance of finding, putting them all into one household because they're just not that opening. It, you know, you maybe have 20% of a chance of getting two kids together, but keeping whole sibling groups together, very difficult. But foster, uh, with kinship or grandparents, when they step forward, they don't say, I want her, but I don't like those two. They take the whole group. And we, we're one person in Can one family in Can Grants has five children. You know that they they went from their two bedroom condo and they had to buy a house because they, they ended up inheriting five kids. But these kids get to grow up together. And my colleague Aaron Schlansky does quite a bit of research on, on keeping siblings together, and the outcomes are much better. They have that bond, something to hold on to forever. They don't feel as alone. Um, now, one of the things we're really considering, are the kids growing up in a culturally similar environment? Well, by the time you get a grandparent doing it, the chances are high that, that that's the case. And there's certainly less social stigma for grandma picking up a kid than a foster parent. But there are some disadvantages. Cuddleback draws some of our attentions. Now, if I'm a foster parent, I don't even have to deal with the mom. But if I'm grandmom and it's my daughter 
there, the conflict can be there. So there's more parent, grandparent, parent caregiver conflict for sure in kinship families. Um, kinship caregivers are on average less educated and poorer than non-kin foster parents. So there's, there might live in worse neighborhoods, there might be fewer exposure to extracurricular activities. Personally, I think we can put those supports in. The um, neighborhoods are less likely to be as, as pleasant, they're more likely to be violent and unhealthy. This is particular in the U.S. context where the inner city, there, there are some really toxic neighborhoods in the U.S. that are very, very dangerous to raise kids in. They're very dangerous. I remember as a social work intern in, in Berkeley, I went to a town nearby called Richmond. And you know, I got out of the car and I realized there is not a hubcap on any car oh in this God. whole place. And I remember like 45 minutes, I was waiting to hear that <laughs> go, go by. And then, but that's just the minimum. Like the grandparents, I mean the older adults I was interviewing, they were the rich people because they got their, their equivalent of their old age supplement. And they, you know, they would they'd get mugged on the way home because they knew what day it had started. It was, there's some really dangerous communities. Um, so kinship caregivers get less training and support from the child welfare system too. Okay, but we're, I'm a gerontologist, so most of my research has been actually at the other end. What's going on with the grandparent? And uh, financial, we've touched on this a little bit. Uh, as we said, they're in every economic group, but on average, they're poorer than non-caregiving peers. And one-third are very poor. Now, this, this is old data from 1996, but we had one-third under $15,000 a year. That, think about it. You're raising at least one kid. So there's at least one adult and one kid. Often there's two adults and one kid on $15,000 a year. And that's your housing, your transportation, your sneakers, your food for adolescent boys. I mean, I don't know if, how you'd cover it. Like, it's just, what a stress. You can see why. Um, well, I didn't put it in. I'm not quite sure why. But grandparent caregivers are also twice as likely to be clinically depressed as non-caregivers. But when I do qualitative work, it's not the grandkids. It's not to, you know being 65 and having two kids under five that's doing it to you. It's listening for the ambulance at night and thinking, is this my daughter this time? You know, oh, deed. It's worried about the middle generation, the reason that the grandchild came into your care. Not so much, even though it, it's, it's exhausting, the children give a lot of joy. And I'll talk a little bit about some of our qualitative work there. So we talked about this, you leave employment to care give. We have a huge problem with not enough child care and wait lists for child care. So if you have two kids dropped under your lap, some people leave work because they can't afford to pay full fees for child care if they can't get back into work. So it decreases your savings, uh, your, your years that you are saving, it decreases your, your pension. Um, you can't get back in, it's just a, it's just a economic nightmare. Um, and you're using up all these savings. Sometimes you have to move to larger accommodation. And a fair number end up with legal custody battles. Because the middle generation, particularly when there's alcohol and drug problems, um, are so poor that they get legal aid. And the older generation are a bit above legal aid. So they can spend a lot of money having a battle back and forth about custody issues. So child, child uh, CAS, the Child Welfare Agency here in Ontario, says, Go get legal custody. They don't, now one agency, I think, uh, actually helps them pay for it. The other one's just tell them to go pay for it. They spend $25,000 getting it, and it, you know, just to, to maintain it, it doesn't make any sense. We haven't got a vision of what it should look like. Anyway, um, housing costs can be crippling. Overcrowding is a huge problem. We did a lot of work in the US on public housing for older adults because they have senior housing and they have general housing. Senior housing is 55 and up. So grandmom takes in grandchildren, gets kicked out of senior housing, but can't get into public housing. So um, there's some dem we've had some new legislation called the Legacy Act passed a few years ago. And we've got 10 demonstration pro uh, projects under HUD, which is their housing funder, about uh, mixed generational households. Um, is the health of grandparent caregivers better or worse than their peers? Well, we could go either way with this. My initial in inclination was that it's got to be better or it would be too overwhelming to take care of it. But no, again, as research all, it, it basically, they're worse off. And so one third of skipped generation households have at least one grandparent with a disability. 
And then I thought, well, maybe it's because the ethnic mix is different. And for example, First Nations have very high rates of disability. So maybe it's just the fact that they're more likely to be First Nations, or in the US, they're more likely to be African American, who are also very vulnerable to ill health and older adults. So then I did some analysis of just First Nations, caregivers versus not, and Native American Alaska, and Alaskan Indian, uh, Native Indian Alaskan NI, Indian and Alaskan Native. I'm not uh, A NIAN, AIAN, -A American Indian Alaskan Native. I'm not comfortable with the terminology, but that is what the is the preferred term by those uh, populations. But Anyway, I did the American Indian Alaska Native analysis in the American census. I looked at African Americans. I looked at Mexican Americans. I looked at Latino Americans. Within each subgroup, the poorest and the most disabled are the ones that stepped forward and became the grandparent caregivers. So even, even within each group, it is definitely the most uh, vulnerable that, that provide the most care. Um, so here's some qualitative interviews that my colleague Meredith Minkler did in her um, her fabulous qualitative study. And if you're looking for an amazing qualitative study with a community-based participatory research and wonderful things came out of it, including a warm line, not a hot line, uh, public testimony to uh, Congress, um, support groups, uh, all kinds of stuff came out of the study. But anyway, here's a quote. Oh, sure, I have high blood pressure and diabetes. I have sleepless nights, but I'm not concerned about my health. What does worry me is this pace I'm trying to keep up. So it, it was a really interesting study in how you have to have a quantitative and qualitative mix because these people were saying they were in pretty good health. But when you started looking at them, there was one woman who said, oh yeah, I'm in pretty good health. And then the qualitative said, well, you know, I, could, I occasionally have to crawl to the kitchen because my back's out, but I've never missed feeding the kids, and that was good health. <laughs> but the other piece is that some of the grandparents, are, or particularly the older ones, are worried about losing their grandchildren if they admit that they have needs. So they're not accessing resources that might be available. <coughs> okay, so here's some more quotes. I don't have the luxury of being sick, so I use my asthma pump and keep going. I bandage my leg, grab my cane, and keep going. I take my medicines and keep going. I don't take my medicines because they make me drowsy and I have to be alert for these kids. So, so you have the whole spectrum. Now, even in her study, a fair number were actually even great-grandparents. So they moved all the way up the generational ladder. Okay, so uh, my colleague, Bert Hayslip, um, did some research in the 90s looking at how self-care patterns. And about two-thirds of grandparents in this Texas study had children whose behavioral problems were so severe they'd sought help for them. But only about 10% sought help for themselves. They're so focused on getting through the day and helping out these grandkids that they don't have enough energy or time or resources left over for them. So that's definitely a possibility uh, explaining it. Okay, but you see some upbeat stuff. I realized I was neglecting myself, so I started seeing a doctor, losing weight, and taking care of myself because I'm the only one he has now. And uh, so why this poor health? Well, demographic fa factors, lower socioeconomic status, makes a big difference. You know, sitting in this room, you're well-educated. You'll be at least middle class with, with whatever job you have. That is unbelievably protective for your health. Education, and also cognitive health, you know, education and income make a huge difference. And demands and circumstances of the caregiving which exacerbate existing conditions. So one of our first health papers, the reviewer just made me so annoyed because he said, are you sure they're in, they're in worse health or do they just notice it? And there is a good point to that is if you're, Say you're 65 and you're starting to have some mobility issues, you don't have to go up and down the stairs 15 times a day to change diapers and carry a 25 pound drill. So, so whatever it is, I, I think that their, their health is a bit more of a problem for them than it was before they began caregiving. Whether it's they're physically they're much in worse state, case, state or they just, the demands on them are higher, you know. Okay, so these are just some of this. Pink is pink is non-caregiving grandparent, non-caregiving grandparents, and yellow are are, are their peers who are caregiving. <coughs> so for IADLs like walking six blocks, those types of activities, you have a difference about 39 to 52 percent, um, and for climbing stairs, you have 27 to 41. So you have trouble climbing stairs, and you're chasing after a toddler. Just think about it. <laughs> 
The Strawbridge did a really interesting study. Uh, it's called the Alameda County Study, and they've been following they've been following kids, a representative sample of kids since they were twenty in 1928, and um, they found that caregivers had two times the functional limitations of non-caregivers. But even 20 years before, when they weren't caregivers, they were also more likely to be disabled. Like, so it follows our, my own findings cross-sectionally that the most vulnerable are the ones who step forward. So he talks about lifelong strains and current difficulties leading to higher disability rates. This is what I think the elephant in the room is, poverty. Life choices, early childbirth, uh, drug addiction, all of the the problems that bring kids into their care, and the the problems that they face, uh, ill health, all of those are highly, highly associated with poverty. So look at the disability information. So these are functional limitations. If you're under the poverty line, you have about 39 percent who are disabled. If you're above 200 percent of the poverty line, you have half that, 20 percent. Now, 200 percent of the poverty line is no great shakes for a couple. Uh, who are over 65, 100% of the poverty line is $11,000. 200% of the poverty line is $22,000. they are not rich, but if you can just move them out of extreme poverty, you'll see, you see quite a bit of difference. Now again, this is cross-sectional data, so uh, a true researcher would say you can't say that moving the poor into being a, a little bit more affluent is going to improve their health, but I would certainly like to be able to try. Racial differences, um, American Indian, Alaska Natives are the most vulnerable, about 35% have uh, functional limitations versus 31% of blacks, whites a little bit lower, and then Asian and Native Hawaiian are doing quite a bit better, partly because the grandparents are, tend to be a little younger in those populations, partly. Okay, now those of you who occasionally babysit. So this is not what I've been talking about, the custodial grandparents. These are the ones that help out 9 to 20 hours a week. So, so that would be, you know, half time or helping out on the weekends. This is, you know, it's a substantial contribution, but it's not anywhere near what I'm talking about. So the, there's a nurse's health study, a huge sample. They had 54,000 people. The women were aged 46 to 71, and they followed them for four years. And those who babysat their grandchildren, had 55% higher odds, odds of coronary heart disease. Now they controlled for the major, the usual self suspects: age. This is a baseline: their age, their hypertension, whether they had diabetes, smoking, family history, body mass index, etc. What I'm not sh uh, what I'm not sure is that they controlled for working. Because if you're trying to put in 20 hours more work when you're already putting in a 40-hour work week, it could be just lack of sleep. Um, extra stress, you know, physical demands of caregiving, rural conflict, could be those. But those are, that's, that's a little worrisome, that data. So, is that the Framingham study? No, well, no, it's another, it's another similar study. Framingham started back in the 1950s. This one started maybe in the 70s or 80s, and it's been following more than 50,000 nurses for many years. So this study, the Kawachi and Berkman are at Yale, and they've been using it to explore different elements, and they, they looked at uh, the consequences for heart disease. So by being prospective, it's controlled for a lot of the things that normal cross-sectional research couldn't do. All right, you might be able to guess this by now. Which Canadian grandparent caregiver group is most disadvantaged? First Nations. Of course, yes, First Nations. So we got, remember we said about a third were below 15,000, or before now it's 42% were below 15,000. They're twice as likely to be raising two or more children, about 40% are raising two or more. Higher rates of disability, so you know, less money, more kids, and uh, more disability. It's not a good combination. Um, now I'm a social worker, so I'm going to tell you about some resources. If you're, how many of you, any of you, in direct practice that you actually have clients? Yeah. All right. Uh, um, or you could be anyway. So CIS, the Child Welfare Agency, can give you financial assistance, but I already said most people can't get in. So the, so this new legislation came in, which is a big step in the right direction, but. Children that were already before 2019, uh, 2007 were living with their grandparents aren't eligible. 
if the grandparent intervened before the CAS was involved, they weren't eligible. But most grandparents who are overseeing things, they step in before there's absolute, you know, it's an absolute crisis. Well, that's it, they're out. So you end up uh, getting a catch-22. Um, and some grandparents just do not want to be under CAS control. And why would that be? Because you your child wants to go to a sleepover at Jody's house. Well, Jody's mother and father have to do a police check. You cannot let your child go for a sleepover. If you want to go shopping in Buffalo, you have to have legal permission because the child's not your ward. So some people who can afford not to do it choose not to go this route, okay? Um, now there's new service which is very, interesting on kinship service which is that they don't get foster care payments they don't get the nine hundred dollars a month or something that foster care payments get but they uh, they can access some services uh, we're just Deb Goodman who's at CAS Toronto and I have a shirt which is a uh, research project to see what kind of um, services are being provided in different jurisdictions and what are the outcomes so if, if you give this service, are they more likely to be still, you know, the permanent placement for the kids, et cetera, subsequently? So, we're, so we, we haven't got the data in on that. So remember we said only about 900 kids are getting that. Everybody else has to look elsewhere. Well, if the parent's deceased, they can get CPP survivor benefits. Now, this is my big bugaboo. So temporary care assistance is kind of like a child-only benefit in Ontario Works, our welfare system. So it, there, since 1926, there's been a, a financial assistance for children who are raised by, not, by people other than their parents, including family members. So it, it used to be called foster allowances, but basically probably coming out of First World War where there was orphans, that if, if somebody, including a teacher or an older adult, step forward to raise a grandchild, they, or raise a child, they could get money that was contingent on the child's income, which is nothing, right, as opposed to on their income. So older adults who get uh, an old age supplement would never be eligible for welfare on their own income because by definition, the minimum older adults get is slightly higher than, than the cutoff. So our older adults are not eligible for um, welfare as a family but there's a child-only benefit that's called temporary care assistance. So that the they changed the name to temporary care assistance in 1998 under Mike Harris's government. Well, in 2001, a directive came down from the Ministry of Community and Social Services. So a directive doesn't change the law, but it helps the workers interpret it. And they use the caregivers. Uh, they uh, the directive said that grandparents actually named grandparents as. Uh, <coughs> as potential caregivers and even though it says the word temporary they said for example a grandparent raising a grandchild because he's orphaned is eligible until he's 18. Well that's not very temporary right so the rules were very clear that grandparents were included. Well starting about 2006 CanGrants which is a grandparent organization um, I work with it's a support group a wonderful support group and the link to it is on the um, handouts we're going to put out the little brochures um, they started getting grandparents who were being cut off. So that family with five kids who'd moved from a condo to a house, well, they were using the, that, it's, it's piddly squat too. The first kid is like 233, the second one is 177. But that was helping pay for their mortgage and they get cut off. So um, we met with, I think as academics we're in privileged positions and if we should be thinking about advocacy. So there's two strategies. One is that you work non-adversarially, but Cindy Blackstock, who is one of our recent uh, PhD graduates and a wonderful advocate, she says you always have to work adversarially at the same time as you're working non-adversarially. And so we, we actually got to meet with two of the ministers in 2008, the Minister of Community and Social Services and the Minister of um, Child and Community, uh, Minister of Child and Youth Services, but nothing happened. So we also worked with pro bono law who've been very supportive and they got us a lawyer. And we took one case and got a very positive um, uh, decision on it. But that's, that's just as a precedent, it, doesn't, it isn't like a law. So uh, there's still people being cut off and we're still you know, trying to pull a lawyer here and a lawyer there. So we're still working on it, but um, we're hoping for some change. Um, the, the, uh, 
certain municipalities are starting to put people on, back on, but people, they didn't change the 2008 directive. So the new directive said, the new directive that they really started getting cut off of said things like um, the length of child, the eligibility for benefits to be assessed on length of child stay with the adult, like temporariness. <coughs> so we just went through the literature that permanency is a key issue. So as soon as you're willing to say, I'm doing this for the duration, you're getting cut off. And uh, if you have a legal custody order, you're getting cut off. Well, but you need a legal custody order to get the kids in school and sign their forms. You know, it's just this terrible catch-22. And so it's whether a settled intent. You know, there, most of these grandparents are hoping that the middle generation is going to function again. It's un highly unlikely, but they're still hoping. So, but they have a settled intent in that they're going to provide the care until it's no longer needed, which probably is when the kid's 20, <laughs> as opposed to next year. Anyway, so we're still working on that. Uh, this is more. Uh, that's kind of good. That these are the people that have been helping us with this. Canadian Association of Retired Persons is <coughs> wonderful. So we did, the Can Grants did a doll campaign. They brought dolls and they left them in, on <coughs> the, um, with their MPs. We met with the ministers. Uh, we submitted briefs. We didn't get any movement. Uh, legal advocacy made some movements. They, we just put out, uh, for grand, in September it was Grandparents Day, an open letter from prominent grandparents who signed it and CARP put it up. It didn't go anywhere. So any suggestions you can give me at the end about how, where we can work, move, work on this. But it just seems so miserly when these grandparents are doing, uh, the research indicates these grandparents are doing a great job. It's keeping them out of the foster care system. The kids are doing better. Could we not provide a little bit of support? And we're talking piddly, piddly. Two, two thirteen. Can you imagine? Anyway, um, I. So we did a qualitative study with 15 grandparent caregivers from each of these following groups. And I'm not going to talk about the Chinese Canadian because it's very much like Bev talked about. It was a very different situation. I'd be happy to talk about it later. But we ended up going to China and doing a study in China to kind of get a perspective. And we realized we, we had, it was a very different story. The people had come over to caregiver and felt it was a different role. And they were really co-parenting with the middle generation who was working long hours. Well, the other groups, the qualitative interviews, were people who were doing the skip generation caregiving. So we came up with all these different themes. I'm only going to talk about one, which was rewards. So the, what I heard was pride, keeping the family together, relieve stress. The ones who were involved with the grandchild before it came into their custody, they were always worried, is she going to end up poisoned, you know, because they're not attending to her, neglected, you know. So that having the grandchild with them relieved the stress. Mutual respect between the grandchild and the grandparent, a sense of purpose, feels more useful. The grandchild reduces feelings of loneliness, so it gives a purpose, and fun. One grandmother said to me, my granddaughter makes me laugh from my toes up. <laughs> and uh, so here's a little quote, and then I'll read you the little aside. Uh, the children in my grandson's class were told a Ukrainian folktale entitled, my mother is the most beautiful woman in the world. My grandson changed the title of his illustration to the story of, uh, of the story to my grandmother. It brought tears to my eyes as it is, and is indeed something I shall treasure forever. So all of the care children who were involved in this little qualitative you know, drawing thing really wanted the caregivers to know how much they loved them. And uh, this is a grandmom talking about his, her grandchildren. Well, I'd like to dance at his wedding. I would really like to see him grown up. I think, of course, that he is the smartest little kid in the world. And the same is true with my granddaughter. When I talk to her, I think, my, isn't she just so smart? I really, really hope that the Creator touches me so I can live as long as I can, so I can see them become the fine adults I know they are going to be, and so they will remember. And then the final, final word to a grandson. So this is a support group, a book called Grandparents Raising Grandchildren or something like that by Sylvie de Toledo. So Sylvie's mother raised her grandson after Sylvie's sister committed suicide. And the, gra uh, the grandson's grown up, doing really well, gone off to university. And this is a letter he wrote back to his grandma. Nona. On July 31st, 1983, you unexpectedly became a mother again. 
You took an eight-year-old boy into your home and treated him like he was your son, as if it was normal. Your life was turned upside down. You lost the most precious thing in the world to you, your daughter. In the middle of your pain and suffering, you found the time to take care of a scared, confused, and uncertain little boy who had just lost his mother. As the little boy got older, he learned how to push your buttons. He had a knack for making your day miserable. Making life hard for you was his way of saying he didn't want another mom. He did everything he could to push you away, but you wouldn't leave him alone. The more problems he caused, the more you were there for him. Getting him out of trouble and pushing him to do something with his life. You never thought twice about helping him when he needed it. When he was sick, you nursed him back to health. When he wanted a ride to a friend's house, you took him. You always tried your hardest to make him happy. Now he has grown up and understands the sacrifices you made for him. Nona, this little boy is a very grateful young man now, and I want you to know how much I appreciate all you've done for me. I want you to know that I'm proud to be your grandson, but most of all, I want you to know I love you. Kevin. Thanks. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Um, this is a little bit peripheral to your work, but we're working on an elder abuse study. It's prevalence, re or it's preparatory work for a prevalence study. And one of the issues that keeps coming up for discussion within our research team is how do we capture systemic abuse? And I was wondering whether when we're looking at, at your work and the gaps in the ways that the system provides for grandparents raising their grandchildren. Do you think that capturing it as a system abusive older adults could potentially mobilize resources in a different way? Or is it better to keep moving in the sort of child welfare uh, path? Um, well, I, I see what you're saying with this. Like it's really roundabout, right? Yeah, I, I, I certainly can say it's an injustice. I guess it depends whether it's an intentional injustice or a, an oversight, and, and because you know it's a relatively small population, right? And there, so it's very hard to get people's attention and say, you know, yeah. this is a, it's a small population, but it's making a big difference for the kids in this country, yeah. and what can we do about it? Um, I don't know. I'd like to. I'll talk to you more about it. I have to sort of. I hadn't thought about it in those terms, so you might. Neither had I. Until <laughs> you yeah. said it. Okay, <laughs> but I'll talk to you afterwards sure. about it. I have to think it through. It's, I, I'm not quite there figuring it out yet. Great. Uh, I, I see. I saw that you present the um, statistic regarding with the, you know, the average age of the grandparent yes. to take care the uh, uh, children, but maybe I missed. But I didn't see. How about the average age of grandchildren? Oh, okay. Yeah. Because yes. I mean that is very, very interesting to me. If you are senior or very old, I mean that the, the role to see uh, their grandchildren maybe is different. Uh, Depending on how old they are. Yeah, yeah. How old they are, you know, what the uh, responsibility. Uh, some of our American research, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, but at least half they started caregiving when the child was under five. So it's actually relatively rare for a, a middle generation, I mean, unless it's a death, usually the, the middle generation have a rocky start, and within a couple years, the kid comes into the care of the grandparent. But many, many are in for the duration, so the child grows up in that context. The earlier you have the child, the probably the easier the transition to uh, teenhood would be because they've had fewer losses and less problems with attachment issues if they came to you quite young. But I don't have the data right here. I see. And also one more thing is that I think that um, all this the data that you brought here is just uh, only for grandparents alone or they call, um, take care of it, their parents. Or oh, whether there's another generation, you mean? No, I mean that the, um, like only grandparents they take care to the grandchildren, yes. but there's no uh, their parents. The parents are involved. 
the, the study I was looking at were really these skip generations. There's a whole literature that I haven't gone into, which is co-parenting. So that grandmom's retired and very involved with the kids, and but it's a nine to five job. And those, the outcomes tend to be very good for those. Yeah. It's a different story. Although the the one piece I touched on a little bit there was the nurse's health study to indicate that there might be some health outcomes uh, that we need to think about. But even in my local kid, my kid's local school, that's not an unusual pattern uh, to have grandparents doing the drop-offs and the pickups and the day-to-day -day care. How about I officially let you go and you can all come talk to me if you have questions. It's lovely to see some familiar faces. Thank you, Leslie. Hi, Ron. Nice to see you. Good. 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 Good.